Hi, and thanks for joining me in the collections today. In this short object lesson, we're going to take a look at the development of printing in Europe using just one book. This is the Fasciculus Temporum, Europe's first printed history of everything. The name Fasciculus Temporum roughly translates to a little gathering of times, and that's exactly what this book is. It's a timeline of world history from the biblical account of creation down to the late 15th century. It was created in the early 1470s by a Carthusian monk named Werner Rolovink, who was looking to line up the histories of the New and Old Testaments, ancient Rome, and its successors, mainly the popes and rulers of modern-day Europe. The frame is modeled on the genealogical succession of biblical figures in the Old Testament, called the Six Ages of Mankind. In the Chronicle, timelines count up from the calculated age of the world, and down to and back from the birth of Christ. Historians had used this scheme for centuries, and a main effect was to center the Christian historical worldview. But each point on these timelines provided opportunities to chart the inventions of things, the movements of peoples, and the discoveries made by different figures. Rolevink was a prolific author and reader, and he inhabited a world where all kinds of information coexisted, gathered out of separate sources into a coherent package by the historian. So now let's talk about that package. The fasciculus was modeled on a work that would have been familiar to any medieval historian, the genealogical role. Works like this could range from the simple to the elaborate, but they took advantage of all the flexibility of the human hand and the skill of teams of scribes who could draw the curves, lines, figures, and copy the text wherever it could fit on the page. Printing, on the other hand, worked in rectangles. Printers needed to set up their type as well as any features like curves, lines, and blank spaces within a rectangular frame called a form, calculating where pages would break and line up. Early printers soon realized it was easiest to rely on scribes to supply the details that made their books useful, like the colored initials that you see here. The fasciculus, however, contained too many of these details to add in after the fact. Its printers would need to find ways to square a circle. Printers of the fasciculus did this by creating special blocks that could contain the metal type, modeled on the genealogical roundels that were common in manuscript books. Different editions of the fasciculus also used woodcut illustrations to mark key elements, the nativity, as well as the building and destruction of famous cities. And while these were largely generic, printers did adapt them to fit their local surroundings. This edition was produced in Venice and adds an illustration of the city. Now, this wasn't a neat system. Looking closely at a text like this, we can see how sources and the printer's own materials needed to be adapted, abbreviated, or set in many different places. Unlike with manuscript, there wasn't the ability to compress writing to fit the space. Wood needed to be cut to fit this section in. So if this work was more complicated and more specialized than producing normal books with a new technology, why would printers do it not just once, but dozens of times? There are two main reasons that I'd like to bring up. The first is the subject matter. Rolevink mentions in his introduction that his aim was to make a specialized system of knowledge easier to understand for more people. Historians had written these all-encompassing works of universal history for a millennium, but their use was often restricted to the communities who copied them, like monasteries and universities. Starting in the 15th century, there was more of an effort to compare different historical traditions chronologically, but these were also done by placing the texts of different histories sequentially and produce sprawling, text-heavy works. The printed fasciculus put this history before a broader audience in a condensed and highly visual layout, introducing them not just to what bits of information they should know, but suggesting how they could be evaluated. Some of these splits could come in innovative ways for print, like this use of half roundels to show the popes and antipopes within the timeline. But in short, readers of all kinds became more interested in comparative history, 
in discovering sources that could fill the gaps in their understanding and seeing where the past, quite literally, didn't line up. This layout encouraged readers to gather, critique, and supplement little bits of history on the page. The fasciculus was one of the first texts to mention the invention of printing, and a reader of this copy has added another early reference from a different history, correcting the position of this event on the timeline. Other editions of the fasciculus would contain blank pages for readers to continue the series of events on their own. Most of the time, when we think about early printed books, we gravitate towards really famous or really luxurious examples. But to my mind, there's no better way to illustrate the way information worked in the print shop or in the mind of its readers than books like the Fasciculus Temporum. Even at its best, it's a scruffy, experimental text, but thousands of copies of it exist all around the world in rare book libraries. We have two separate editions right here in the collections at UF, and you can often find digital copies of the earliest printed versions of it to compare them. If you do this, remember, you're not looking at a set edition or a stable text, but a living experiment in printing and information technology. If you'd like to know more about these books or see them for yourself, please check out the extra information we have in our research guide and get in touch with any questions. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you soon.